Hey everybody, how's it going? My name is Andrew, and this is an AWS tutorial series on GitLab High Availability. What we're going to be doing in this tutorial series is we're going to be taking the GitLab application and we're going to be breaking it out into multiple different servers. We're going to have traffic coming through into a load balancer, hitting the GitLab application servers, and then those application servers will be fed from a distributed file system, a Redis cache layer, and a SQL database. So let's go ahead and get started. There's a couple things I've taken care of and gotten out of the way. Um, I have a previous tutorial on creating an ExtremeFS distributed file system. So I've gone ahead and already booted those servers now. I'll link in the description below on how to do that. And I've also created some security groups just to get them out of the way. For now, these all have inbound and outbound of wide open. Um, but what we're going to be doing later is we're going to be locking these down to only the servers that they need to talk to. So we've created a Redis cache layer, Elastic Load Balancer, RDS for our database, and an EC2 for our application servers. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to launch a GitLab application server. So we'll click on Launch Instance. For this, we're going to choose the Amazon Linux AMI. We can use a T2 Micro, since it's just a demo. We're going to launch it in our VPC. We'll leave it with a public IP, that's fine. We can leave the volume at 8 gigs, and we'll tag this as EC2 GitLab. Select our existing security group, we'll choose EC2 GitLab, and we'll click Launch. And I've already created an AWS Tutorial Series key pair for myself. So while my server is initializing, we're going to want to do a couple things. We're going to want to launch our Redis server and we'll launch our database server. So we'll go under services and go to ElastiCache. From here, the first thing we're going to want to do is create a cache subnet group. And we'll call this one GitLab. We'll select our VPC. And US East 1A is fine. We'll give it this subnet. We'll click add. So now we'll go to cache clusters. We're going to want to launch Redis. And since this is a demo, I'm going to disable replication. But for a production environment, you want to enable that. We'll call this one GitLab Redis. And again, since this is a demo, we can choose a micro instance. We'll select our VPC, our availability zone. We'll give it our security group of Redis GitLab. And we have no preference on our maintenance window, and we don't need to set up SNS notifications. And we can go ahead and launch our cluster. So we'll give that a minute to create itself, and we'll go and launch our database server. So we'll go to services, and we're going to want to go to RDS. We're going to want to create a subnet group. And we'll call this one database. Select in our VPC. And for RDS servers, you need to uh, have two different subnets inside. So we'll say 1A and we'll say 1B. We'll click Create. And now we're going to want to go to Instances. We'll launch a DB instance. We're going to launch a Postgres server. We're going to say no to multi-AZ deployment because this is just a demo. We'll choose a micro. We'll use our existing VPC. We'll select no. And we'll just give it 15 gigabytes because I'm not actually sure how much uh, GitLab takes up. And we'll call this GitLab DB. And we'll just copy that over for all of them. Click next. We're going to want to use our RDS security group that we created. We'll give the database name the same as GitLab DB. And we don't need to set up a backup since it's just a demo, but I would definitely recommend this if you're going to run this in production. We can go ahead and click launch. So now our database server will take a little bit to create. And we can go back to our EC2 where we should probably have our server available. And good, we do. So let's go ahead and log in to this GitLab server, and we're going to install GitLab and configure its GitLab.rb file. 
So we'll go ahead and log into our server. First thing we'll do is sudo up and we'll run a yum update. We'll give it a dash y. Looks like we're all up to date. So now we'll go over to about.gitlab.com slash downloads and I'll put a link for this. And all we're going to do is we're going to run these commands that they have here. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to download the GitLab RPM. And this will just take a second. So now that that's downloaded, we'll copy over the installs that we need. We need OpenSSH. And you know what? Let me make this a little cleaner here for you. We need OpenSSH. We need Postfix. We need Crony. And we're going to give it a dash Y so it just automatically installs them for you. Great, so we'll start Postfix. And we'll make sure it starts when the server boots. And our last command here is, this is the install for GitLab. So we're gonna install GitLab now. And this will just take a second. And the one thing we gotta make sure we don't do is configure GitLab and start it. We wanna keep it stopped so we can edit the configuration file and then we'll reconfigure it and start it up. And everything should boot with the uh, services on different servers. Great, so GitLab is now installed. The next thing we need to do is we need to create the distributed file system. So if we look back at the high availability uh, diagram here, we need to create this piece. Um, so I already have the ExtremeFS uh, server system created. So now we need to install the ExtremeFS client onto our GitLab server so it can talk to our uh, other ExtremeFS uh, storage, metadata, and directory server. So again, I've already created a tutorial on this and I'll link that again in the description below. But I'm gonna walk you through real quick installing the client. So, um, go into our repositories. We're gonna get the ExtremeFS repository. And all we're gonna do is we're going to install the ExtremeFS client. So now that the ExtremeFS client is installed on our GitLab server, we're going to want to register a volume and then mount it onto the server. So what we're going to do is we're just going to stay in the temp directory here in cd temp. We'll jump over to our quick start guide here and we're going to register a volume with our metadata server. So all we have to do is grab the metadata server IP address. We're going to call this GitLab data volume. Great, so we can see that we've successfully created a GitLab data volume. So now what we're going to do is on the same server, we're going to make a new directory called GitLab data volume. And now what we're going to do is we're going to mount the volume we just created onto this server. So we'll get our mount. What we need to do is we need to get the directory server public IP address, paste that in there. We'll give it the volume name. And this is very, very important. We need to do dash O allow other. And the reason for this is, is that we want the git user to be able to write to this volume because otherwise it would only be the root user allowed to write to it. So we need to make sure we can allow other users. And all we're going to do is we're going to specify the directory we created. So we're going to mount the drive from the directory server, which is called the GitLab data volume. We're going to let other people access it, and we're going to mount it right at that directory we just created. And so if we list this out, we can see we have a successful mount. So now we can edit our GitLab configuration file, which is located in Etsy GitLab, GitLab.rb. And I've gone ahead and done this already for you just because it's a lot to type. Um, all of this information, the Postgres information, uh, this, like the host and the port, um, I just got from the RDS um, area of my server. And the same thing with Redis. Um, so we have our data directory pointing to our GitLab volume. We have our Redis host on our external Elastic Hash server. And we have our database server on our external um, database host. So we can go ahead and save this. And now what we need to do is we need to run GitLab configure. So we're going to run GitLab reconfigure. Okay, so we can see at the very end of our reconfigure 
that GitLab HQ production does not exist, and that's totally fine. We need to seed our database first and then run reconfigure again. So we ran reconfigure once only because we needed to generate a specific file needed to seed the database. So now we can finally seed the database with our GitLab setup. Let me make this a little, a little clearer here. So what we're going to do is we're going to use GitLab rake and set up our database. We're going to say yes. So now that our database has been seeded, now we can run reconfigure one more time and we should get a full success. Great, so GitLab has been reconfigured. So now all we need to do is we need to say GitLab CTL and we're going to say start. So now that GitLab has started successfully, we can go to our public IP address and we can see that we get the GitLab landing page. So real quick while we have this and before we do anything else, we can go ahead and log in. So the default username is root and the default password is live life. And go ahead and click sign in. And it's going to ask us for a new password. So I'm just going to call this password. And so we can say root. And if we say password, we should be able to log into GitLab. Great. So now we are in GitLab. So the last couple things we need to do is we need to create a load balancer, create another application server so it can round robin between the two, and we'll create our first repository. So to do this in a very easy way, I'm going to just create an image of our EC2 GitLab server, and we'll call this one GitLab Server 1. So I'm going to create an AMI of that. We'll call this GitLab and we'll say no reboot. So we'll create an image. And then from this image, I'm going to just launch an exact copy and then we'll put them in a load balancer. So we can go ahead to load balancers, create a new load balancer. We're gonna launch it within our VPC and we'll call it GitLab. Port 80 is fine. Our health check is just going to be on the root. We'll give it all available subnets. We'll give it our ELB security group. And for now, we don't need to assign any instances. We can do that later. Continue and click Create. Now that we have a load balancer ready, we can go ahead and wrap a couple few more things up. Our AMI is available, so we can launch a server from this. We'll keep it a micro. Keep everything the same. We'll call this EC2 GitLab Server 2. Give it a security group of the EC2 GitLab. We'll click Launch. Now the one thing I forgot to mention is also locking down the security groups. So I'm just going to walk you through real quick um, what I have done. Um, and we'll start with the load balancer. The load balancer is allowing inbound traffic from anywhere, but only on port 80. Its outbound is only on port 80, and it's only going to talk to the EC2 servers. The EC2 servers have an inbound of 80 from the Elastic Load Balancer, and for now, I just have port 22 open to everyone. I should just lock this down to either my VPC or my IP address. It's just so I can log into the server still. For production, I would not recommend that. Outbound, we're allowing HTTP and HTTPS to get updates, and we're only allowing 6379 and 5432 to go to their respective Redis and RDS servers. The RDS server is allowing inbound of its port from the EC2 servers and outbound to get its updates. The exact same thing with the Redis server, it's allowing outbound HTTP and HTTPS to get its updates and it's allowing inbound from its respective port from the EC2 GitLab server. So now we can pop back over to our Instances tab and we can see that our Server 2 is online. So now we can put both of those 
inside of our load balancer. So if we edit instances, give it GitLab Server 1, GitLab Server 2, go ahead and click Save. So I just realized after I click Save that I need to edit my health check to be on slash users slash sign in. So once you hit the root directory of GitLab, it reroutes you to this page. So in order for your health check to be successful, you need to edit that there. So we can see that both of our servers are now in service. So we can go to our DNS name now. It'll bring us to the user sign-in page. We can go ahead and select root and say password. Go ahead and click remember me. We can sign in. We can save our password. And we're in GitLab. And we're on a load balanced cluster. If you go to the admin area, and we go to background jobs, we can see that we're running on our separate Redis server that we've created. And before we go ahead and create any new projects or groups, um, there is one thing that I forgot to do that's pretty crucial in order to create these. Um, and I'm inside one of the servers right now, inside the uh, CD temp, inside the temp directory. We need to make sure we own the uh, the GitLab data volume as git, as the user git and the owner git, or the group git. Um, and this is because uh, GitLab runs as the user git, so in order for it to write to this volume, remember we passed that dash o allow other, we also need to uh, make sure we own these as git. So I had to do that on both of my servers, and you'll just remember when you create your AMI, you'll have to make sure it's created with this, uh, this git user and git owner. So now that that's set on both of those servers, we can go ahead and click New Project, and we'll call this GitLab Project New. We'll go ahead and create new project, and we can see, boom, we've got a new project. So that is GitLab High Availability. Um, I know it was a pretty lengthy tutorial, but as long as you followed everything step by step, you should be good to go. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please leave them in the comment section below. And please remember to like and subscribe. All right, thank you so much for watching.